Thanks very much, Nancy, and thanks also for making this conference happen. Uh, organizationally, of course, but more important, intellectually. More than half a century ago, uh, in 1962 to be precise, I was able to live in the city of Hiroshima for six months interviewing survivors of the first nuclear weapon dropped on a human population. I was intent on doing scientific research by means of systematic interviews, and I, of course, tried to bring the ethical standards of my profession to that work, and those included consent from those interviewed, sensitivity to their psychological state, and refraining from any approach that might be harmful to them. But there was another ethical issue I was aware of, though I lacked words for it, having to do with making known to the world what these survivors told me. That required taking in their stories and retelling them from a psychological perspective, and I would later think of this as bearing witness, as uh, as a professional to what I encountered in that city. And I came to realize that the more disciplined I was in presenting my findings scientifically, the more effective my witness would be. From that stay in Hiroshima, my witness, as I came to recognize it, could be stated in just six words, one plane, one bomb, one city. Of course, that Hiroshima witness had to do with nuclear threat <clears throat> rather than climate, but it turned out that these threats were never entirely separ separable. Right after the bomb, the most persistent rumor in Hiroshima that people constantly described to me was that trees, grass, and flowers would never again grow in their city, that because of the bomb's poison, the radiation, uh, the city would be unable to sustain vegetation of any kind. Nature would dry up altogether so that life would be extinguished at its source. This rumor suggesting a form of desolation that not only encompassed human death, but went beyond it. Of course, vegetation did return to Hiroshima, but the fear suggested the sense of people in Hiroshima that their habitat was destroyed, that in addition to the sea of death that they were exposed to, uh, the source, the natural source, of their existence was uh, under deep threat. And actually, that rumor informed my own early struggles, though rather inchoately uh, after that. I just found in recent years an old paper I wrote that I'd kind of forgotten about, which I called Hiroshima and the Ultimate Pollution. Never published it, but spoke about it now and then. And I spoke of the breakdown in that paper of ecological balance of poison and degeneration, uh, I was sensing the destruction or threat to the human habitat, but most of us didn't yet see uh, the environmental threat as worthy of our study in itself. Uh, that would come soon but was not yet available to me. And I was, I was ignorant of the work already being done by climate scientists. Uh, but I sensed that the effect of that first atomic bomb significantly included a profound threat to the human habitat. Now, to be sure, uh, Hiroshima is the most extreme kind of event uh, and lends itself to some impulse toward witness. But the same is true of climate change. Its ultimate effects can be no less extreme. And the larger point here is that what we generally refer to as professional ethics, 
upholding the best standards of our professions. Important as that is, doesn't suffice in our present world. We require an ethic that transcends our professions in its application to larger human groups. But that ethic itself, that transcendent ethic, comes from nowhere else than within our own professions. Uh, and, and that's why Nancy could center on the ethics of expertise. That's very much what we're about today. All societies uh, impose what can be called cultural and social norms, forms of behavior that are expected of people in various situations. Um, and we professionals work under that constraint. Indeed, we often uh, intensify the uh, social norms or uh, give them a certain legitimation because of our influence, and in that sense, deepen social norms. But what if social and political norms become themselves destructive, threatening to human life? What recourse do we then have as professionals to combat such dangerous claims to what is normal and expected? And here we come to what I call malignant normality. And I, it's not surprising that I came to the, uh, the concept of malignant normality uh, from my work on Nazi doctors. Uh, you know, Nazi doctors, like all professionals, were subjected to Gleichschaltung, which means synchronization or resynchronization of the profession, and it entailed getting rid of those potential uh, opponents and substituting reliable Nazis. So. Uh, Gleichschaltung meant not destruction, but <coughs> Nazification of the professions. That meant that when a German doctor was assigned to Auschwitz, uh, where he selected Jews for the gas chamber, this was what he was expected to do. This was his job. This was his normal behavior. Some doctors had difficulty in performing that job, and then they were helped to do it in a kind of perverse form of psychotherapy so that older hands would drink with him, would encourage him, would strengthen his resolve to carry through his duty. Now, that's the most extreme form of malignant normality, but malignant normality can occur in democracies like our own and have occurred long before Trump. For instance, uh, one could say a great deal, and I'll just make a suggestion about the sequence of malignant nuclear normality in the United States after World War II. First, the idea of fighting, sustaining, and winning nuclear war, and the projections by people like Herman Kahn and Edward Teller uh, in that regard. Uh, second, so-called living with nuclear weapons, the Kennedy School at Harvard and its advocacy of a form of deterrence whose ethics, whose ethical requirements might in some cases require use of the weapons. And then of course the notorious uh, SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, so-called Star Wars, where we created uh, technical devices to oppose the uh, technical attacks of nuclear weapons, uh, a method that was unproven and unprovable. You could get to the point where you could be sure that most nuclear weapons wouldn't get through, but never that all of them would not get through. And all these depended upon the notion of civil defense, the notorious duck and cover drills all this was part of nuclear normality. Those drills taking place in the 50s and 60s and after that and uh, all through American schools uh, in which kids were told that if you put your head under a desk and put a piece of paper over your head, you'd be safe from nuclear fallout. The six-year-old kids were too bright to believe that, but they were deeply confused uh, and they had uh, 
delayed symptoms and fears later on, according to a study that was done by a close colleague of mine. But more significant, or as significant, nuclear normality was upheld by official government, an official government commission in 1956, made up of so-called distinguished professionals, described as wise and mature individuals, including psychiatrists, other physicians, social scientists, retired military officers. And these were to prepare Americans for effective psychological defenses. I'm quoting, effective psychological defenses against nuclear war. And the heart of it was that one shouldn't, uh, one shouldn't dwell too much or let Americans dwell too much on awareness of annihilation in relation to nuclear weapons, because that could cause Americans to seek to resist nuclear war at any cost. All this official American commission in deepening uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear normality or malignant no nuclear normality. Of course, there was opposition to this, and the scientist movement which could be called an early expression of witnessing professionals. The scientist movement against use of the bomb on human populations began even before the end of World War II, before the unsuccessful petition by scientists to prevent the bomb used on a human population. And there, was, there also have been the later successors, uh, again in a professional realm, the physician's anti-nuclear movement, of which I've been a part. Uh, and I'd emphasize very simply, in our doctor's anti-nuclear movement, it was a very conservative movement. We really had a, a simple message. We can't patch you up this time. We're doctors, we'd like to help, but the trouble is hospitals will be destroyed, med medical uh, facilities will be des destroyed, you'll be probably dead, and we'll probably be dead, so there isn't much we can do. That was our simple message, uh, and uh, as you know, uh, that message we eventually took around the world, and the physician's movement was, was uh, given a Nobel Peace Prize. But it was simply a matter of professionals using professional experience and knowledge uh, to put forward an ethic that was all-encompassing and universal. Now, if we turn to global warming, malignant climate change, it's different from any other threat. We're born into it. It envelops us. Nothing in life is outside of it. That is more encompassing even than the nuclear threat. Uh, and that presents us with an ultimate absurdity of a kind we've never faced before, I believe. If we do nothing other than what we're doing now in our use of fossil fuels, nothing, that is not start any wars, not bring in uh, suicide, uh, 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 devices that are genocidal like nuclear weapons, not do anything like that, we can still destroy our civilization, much of it within this century. What could be a more, what could be a greater absurdity than that? No wonder that many say, uh, many neuroscientists and psychologists, that our wiring does not permit us to confront climate change. I think that statement is only half right and therefore misleading. It's quite true that our wiring uh, permits us more quickly and accurately to respond to immediate threat than to projected threat. There's no doubt about that. But it's also true that this remarkable entity we call human mind has evolved in an evolutionary way to be able to imagine beyond the immediate and to imagine a different time and a different place. So it may be that those who claim that our um, uh, wiring doesn't permit us to cope with climate change are inadvertently uh, 
strengthening the malignant climate normality. Now, of course, climate scientists, uh, and including those among us at this conference, have now, for some decades, been countering this malignant climate normality. One need look at, at the key moment of 1988 when James Hansen made his historically significant testimony about global warming before the, a Senate subcommittee that perhaps was a, a watershed in uh, consciousness about climate threat. Sadly, Hansen has since come out uh, for nuclear energy on a large scale and not always well argued and has uh, troubled many of his colleagues. But that moment of 1988 still remains what it was. And of course, part of our conference includes Michael Oppenheimer and Naomi Oreskes, who have been leaders in carrying through this message of climate, a malignant, norm malignant climate normality, and in that way, uh, serving as witnessing professionals over time. The good news that we have is that the awareness of climate change has deepened, uh, has taken better and more uh, systematic shape in recent decades. We can speak of a sequence from fragmentary to formed awareness. And I call this the climate swerve, using that term swerve, uh, which comes, which is as old as Lucretius and suggests a shift in consciousness or awareness that is not always predictable or manageable. But there's, in this case, a shift from fragmentary to formed awareness. Fragmentary awareness of climate danger being an image here about uh, uh, a hurricane, another image about a wildfire, uh, an image about uh, uh, danger on coastlines as opposed to formed awareness, which is a more systematic narrative of cause and effect, so that when one uh, is exposed to wild, wild, <coughs> wildfires, floods, or um, <coughs> other forms of climate change damage, it is put together uh, and becomes an issue for people to address their energies, both intellectual and political. Now, the event that epitomized the climate swerve was the Paris Conference in December 2015. I'm not going to say much about it except to say that it probably had as great importance for the, mi for the universal mindset of climate recognition that it uh, expressed as it did for any legally uh, compulsive uh, actions. So the Paris Accords of 2015 uh, were uh, a dramatic indication of the climate swerve and of this change in mindset. What we see in this sequence is a shift in groups to which we feel ourselves responsible. One can say that in terms of ordinary professional ethics, they require decency to clients and colleagues. This larger ethic of the witnessing professional requires decency to our species. The operative group becomes no longer that of the individual or the family or the clan or the nation. The operative group becomes that of the species and that of other species. Now, if I said this 10 or 15 years ago, it would have sounded grandiose. But the fact is that whenever we take a stand, and apply our knowledge to combating climate change, we are addressing the needs of the human species and nothing left. 
because the whole issue of climate threat is a species matter. In that sense, we're seeing climate normality as itself unstable. Uh, and for that reason, I now prefer not to speak of climate deniers, but rather of climate rejectors. And the reason for that is that everybody, even Trump and Pruitt, know in some part of their minds that climate threat exists, but they reject that part knowledge. In another part of their minds, they may deny it or call it a hoax, as they do. They reject that knowledge because it's antithetical to their worldview, their identity, that of their party, and that of their donors. And it becomes more and more difficult to continue to reject those climate truths, given the power of the climate swerve, of the shift in mindset that I'm speaking of. And so it becomes very difficult for the climate rejectors to sustain their rejection. That may sound odd, given the pressures we're under, some of which Nancy described, from climate rejectors. But the fact is, when Trump has tried to pull us out of Paris. He's only partially succeeded in doing so. His intent was met with outrage all through the world, including mayors and governors in this country and in Europe and elsewhere. And then the White House backtracked slightly and said, well, we can't withdraw for three years according to the rules. We'll send a representative and perhaps we can renegotiate, which would mean renegotiate with oneself since each country set its own norms. In any case, my point is that what I'm calling the climate swerve, this vast shift in awareness, is larger than any person or group. That doesn't mean that people like Trump and Pruitt can't do enormous harm to the human environment as they're doing, and to our country in various ways. But it does mean that they are ultimately subject to the climate swerve, uh, which will have its say uh, long after they are gone. Finally, the witnessing professional, what we're talking about as the center of our uh, conference and our uh, concerns. Uh, just to put things very briefly, as I became interested in the ethics of professionals in various studies I did, uh, some of which I've mentioned, uh, I learned that as early as the 12th century, there was the idea of uh, professing one's convictions. These were religious convictions, of course, at that time, or professing one's vows as a member of a religious order. But over subsequent centuries, as uh, society became more secularized and more technicized, professions became more a matter of technical knowledge and skill rather than religious faith, so much so that professions became technicized and viewed very often as ethical, uh, ethically neutral. So they were then, in a way, potentially made available to the highest bidder, and in extreme forms, professionals could become, as they often are, hired guns. Uh, now, this kind of behavior has always been resisted within the professions, but it's very clear that we need a third level of identity, and that's what we're calling the witnessing professional, and it's simply a level of identity that, uh, in, that insists on making known and available and using with rigor technical knowledge and experience from that profession and, and combining it with the larger ethic of the preservation and <coughs> enhancement of our species and other species. In that sense, the witnessing professional attempts to combine technical skill with larger ethical advocacy. This, of course, as I've said, and as Nancy also made clear, 
transcends the ethics put forward, as important as they are, in each of our professions. So, it insists upon making use of our expertise for larger ethical purposes. One, one aspect of expertise that has often cast a shadow on it is that it's been mainly used in the service of the status quo or the powerful against those with less power uh, and more in need. Uh, in a sense, we're reversing and altering this while in no way renouncing the expertise. In closing, let me say that in this conference, we're hardly creating a completely new entity. In related ways and using different language, witnessing professionals have long been active and influential in combating climate change. What we are doing is becoming or continuing to be part of a constructive climate swerve that is well underway. It's, of course, late in the game. Much could and should have been done earlier that would have made our climate situation less dire. Yet by pursuing the model of the witnessing professional, we can do much to renew and enhance our habitat and to in infuse that enterprise with a modest amount of hope. Yes, nothing is guaranteed but we have reason for a modest amount of hope. Of course it's late in the game, but considering the consequences, far from too late. Let me close uh, with a quotation. Uh, it's from a, a Viennese physician you might have heard of, uh, and I don't usually quote him, but Freud was uh, notoriously skeptical of human agency uh, finding in his work that we were driven by instinct and emotion. Yet, toward the end of his life, he said this, the voice of the intellect is a soft one, but it does not rest until it has gained a hearing. Thank you very much. Or, or comments, responses right. um, for Robert. Um, well, I think also for Nancy. So um, let me invite and let me invite people to um, just identify yourself very briefly um, as, as you speak throughout the day. I'd like to begin. Yes. Uh, my name is Amy Cohen. I'm a physician, a practicing physician, and I know that you're a physician as well. Psychiatrist? Is that what you're hearing? Yes. I, I'm sorry, can you speak louder, please? You're a physician? Yes, I am. Myself. I think that there's a huge area of push that we need in the medical community. I know there are various groups. My question for you is, um, what is your experience working with other physicians in terms of the communities and societies in pushing the concept of um, climate change, health-related issues, and what we're facing in the future? Um, I've had more experience with physicians in anti-nuclear work uh, I came to climate work fairly late, as I made clear in my remarks, but the anti-nuclear work serves as a model which I can see beginning to operate in climate work as well. Physicians could plunge into anti-nuclear work and find a healing voice as physicians in doing so. That surprised me, and I found young doctors who had difficulty speaking or dealing with larger issues, finding their voice because of a hunger for something they sensed was deeply dangerous that their profession could contribute knowledge and uh, help to. And I feel that is happening in the minds of many physicians in relation to climate change. Uh, and certainly there are physicians groups that I've had contact with and psychologists, uh, larger numbers, uh, who are doing just that, who are
bringing their professional background and uh, experience and recognizing that this special experience of theirs as related to their profession has particular relevance for climate uh, change and addressing it to the dangers of malignant climate normality. I think that one more thing about physicians that I think is implied in your question. You know, in becoming physicians, there's some glimmer of our minds that still has the idea of being healers. Uh, often that's kind of blurred by uh, complexities of medical insurance and all the difficulties of earning a living and other things in our society. But it's there and it's reawakened by these larger issues that one can join. Yeah, I just want just one, one point. I think this, your question raises an interesting ethical problem because what you've described is the organization of physicians, right, to be advocates in public life. Do you talk to your patients about this? I mean, if, if you have a patient with asthma, right, do you talk about the relationship between... Absolutely. So I'm a, an I'm a uh, rheumatologist and integrative medicine doctor. Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm a rheumatologist and integrated medicine doctor and environmental health. So I work with a lot of the endocrine and disrupting chemical community. And um, you know, I do because my practice is set up where I have the time. Um, I think most conventional me excuse me, medical practices are 15 minute intervals with patients and very little gets done and it's also dealt with, you know, medications and that kind of thing. So, you know, I think that on an individual level it's wonderful to be able to talk to your patients, but when you're talking about movements and shifts, um, you really have to get to a bigger groups, bigger audiences. Um, I think there are, you know, Physicians for Social Responsibility is a very big group that talks about climate change. Um, we don't have a chapter here, which would be nice if there was in New Jersey. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a really difficult challenge even in talking about how environmental chemicals, that's my area, affect human health, um, you know, plastics and personal care products and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, on an individual basis, uh, absolutely the rise in asthma, tick-borne illness is one of the areas that I, I deal with um, on a medical level and all the changes with, um, you know, earlier, um, you know, uh, ticks coming out at earlier times and different types of tick-borne illness. So I guess the question is, or there's no real answer to this other than the fact that there's a movement that I believe that is moving uh, as long as there's the right instruction, textbooks, ones I'm involved with, um, but it's a huge army of people that I think are really underutilized um, if there is interest. And you know, not always there's interest. I so there were that. two more comments, I think, both from Fiz Oh, OK. So let's take three more comments, and then we'll close. So um, Mark, um, Lisa, and Harold. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, um, I actually am going to be talking a bit um, about that. I'm, I'm a physician with the National Medical Association, but also with the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, um, which is a relatively new organization. And so I'll be talking about that when I talk a little bit later. Okay. Um, Lisa, can, let me get the mic. Well, I, I, I think I can probably yeah. talk loud enough. Uh, I often have this uh, argument with my colleagues who don't want to bring the uh, agenda of the therapist into a counseling session, but it's made for us. And furthermore, if you, I feel something like a cat waiting for a mouse, a patient will come in and say, God, it's really hot, or something like that. And that's the opportunity that we have to say, you know, can you talk about, is the heat uh, bothering you? Have you noticed that there are more, etc.? We do this all the time. And if we don't, we're complicit. Imagine the patient who's drinking too much or abusing something else. If we don't bring it up, we are complicit. Thank you. Let's take one more comment, um, and then any yeah. responses. Harold. It's really just a question. Yeah. Uh, the issue of the witnessing professional going from just their professional obligations to their obligations to the, to the world. Uh, but there's an important political division out there, namely the country. Okay, and we operate as nations. So I'm wondering if you have any observations regarding not just jumping from the professional responsibilities to the world responsibilities, which are a little harder to define. What about the interim step, which I'm just suggesting a nation, uh, since that's the way we seem to be organized. Well, it's, it's a vast, pro what you're raising is a vast problem. The, the nation state is often the barrier. Uh, what was 
extraordinary about Paris is that, in a way, it uh, did a, an end run around the nation state. Of course, each nation state had to make its pledge, but the pledge was to reducing fossil fuels in the atmosphere in a universal fashion. Uh, the nation state, you know, reflects political positions and becomes susceptible to domestic issues, which often can be um, uh, climate rejecting. So it's pro I think you're wise in raising the issue of the nation state as what might be the source of the greatest political problem in relation to uh, a mindset of what I'm calling the uh, climate swerve. Wonderful. So we are just on time. So um, let me ask you to join again in thanking our first two speakers.